Hello, everyone. My name is Zach Lewis. I am the CISO for the University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy. And today we're going through a story of a, a ransomware incident that the university experienced back in April of 2023. I feel like the security industry as a whole doesn't share enough about our attacks, our ransomware incidents, other security incidents that happen. And we know that the threat actors are sharing the way they have successful attacks, what works for them, the companies that they're hitting and, and organizations that they're attacking. But the security practitioners in our space, we don't share. It's it's almost of a like a mark of shame. And I think we need to do a better job of of telling our stories, how how these threat actors are getting in, how they're attacking us, so we can better protect ourselves and our organizations. So who is Lockbit? A lot of you are probably familiar with Lockbit. In 2022, they were the most active global ransomware group. Uh, on the scene in in 2023, they had some pretty major victories for them, you know, um, as well. Victims including Boeing and TSMC, University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy. If you follow the news in 2024, the year has not been as good for them. Um, we've seen website takedowns, arrests made in their leadership, um, and even though they've started popping up a little bit here in the last couple months, we think that they were hit pretty hard by the FBI, and and that's a good thing. A little background of our environment before we dive in. So at the university, we have had a, a lot of end of life equipment. Um, so back in 2023, our server infrastructure, our storage infrastructure was was end of life. And um, we were coming out of COVID. So supply chain had been difficult, but we were expecting a delivery of, of new um, equipment within three or four weeks before our incident occurred. So we were thinking in our minds, hey, we just got to get this puppy across the finish line, keep everything running, and then we can start trading off to the new equipment and we'll be solid. Cloud migration. We were getting ready to move a lot of our infrastructure out to the cloud. So with this end of life equipment and this refresh of server infrastructure, we were looking to move a lot of our server environment out to the cloud to be hosted there to lower our on-prem footprint. Firewall issues. Um, in 2022, our firewalls had gone into life and we had replaced those. Um, as, as some of you are probably aware with the supply chain problems from COVID, it was hard to get equipment. Um, we waited almost five months to get our firewalls delivered. And when they did, um, we implemented them into our environment, got everything set up and started noticing problems right out of the gate. Come to find out, um, these firewalls were faulty from the factory. They had a, a hardware component inside of them that was malfunctioning and was causing them to not be able to function the way they were supposed to. So we actually had to ship those back and try to get replacement firewalls, which the vendor then told us that, you know, it might be another three, four, five months, which didn't work for us, right? We have end of life equipment. We need to get something refreshed, which pulls us right into the next bullet point, co-management. Since we couldn't source brand new firewalls, we, we went to a local ISP who actually had a, a source of firewalls and was able to co-manage a solution with us. Um, we brought those firewalls in, set everything up, and discovered that MFA could not be enabled for VPN. Kind of maybe see where the dots are starting to connect here on how this attack might have happened. Continuing on, we had a very SaaS first intent. So the university was very focused on, on moving any applications we could out to a SaaS platform. So they weren't hosted with us. They weren't directly managed by us, but out there in the cloud so people could access them from anywhere. And finally, in December of 22, we performed a tabletop exercise with leadership around ransomware. So our, our leadership team was pretty familiar with what a ransomware was, what we would need to do to respond and act, who would be leading, who would be communicating with the public, etc. So let's break down this attack. On April 13th, at about 4.30 in the morning, the university experienced a loss to our on-site servers and services. A couple hours later, a handful of users on campus received an email stating that we had been attacked and 75 gigs of data was stolen. At that time, no one submitted any ticket or or email that, you know, they had received some sort of malicious email or anything suspicious. Probably people just blew it off as spam. I mean, in a campus of 2,000 users, what's, you know, five or six emails of people seeing them? No one knew. So come 7 o'clock, the IT team begins our disaster recovery procedures. Again, not knowing that a cyber attack has occurred. So it takes us a few days, and we finally get the campus back to, you know, an operational status. Most of our SaaS users who, you know, students use SaaS platforms in our environment, didn't even know we had experienced an incident. That it, that that services, those, those applications stayed up. No users had still reported anything encrypted, 
or any compromised machines. Our servers were functioning. Our data was available. At this point, we were thinking, hey, you know, hardware's end of life. It it means end of life. You know, this stuff is dead. So a couple days later, the server environment crashes again. So immediately we go back into disaster recovery. We're thinking, okay, we got to still limp this hardware across. This is going to be a long two or three weeks as we wait for this hardware to come in. And that's when we find a ransomware note on the root of our hypervisor hardware. And we'll, we'll see that note here in a little bit. So we immediately ceased recovery options and met with our leadership team to update and shift to our incident response plan. Right when that happened, I made three important phone calls. The first one to our cyber insurance company. And I said, hey, we've had a ransomware attack. I need some help. The second was to CISA. Hey, CISA, man, we've had a ransomware attack. I need some help. And finally, I called my wife and said, hey, we had a ransomware attack. I'm probably going to be late, and this might be a resume-generating event, so get strapped in, guys. <laughs> On April 22nd, we met with outside counsel, our general counsel, um, our incident recovery team, and started negotiations with the threat actor. Let's look a little bit into the steps of the intrusion before we go back to the, the timeline of events. So VPN, normally we have locked down on our firewall to only a set group of users who can get in and access the VPN. Once we have moved firewalls to firewalls and it had gone from the one that was working end of life to the one that was broken and then to the, finally to the co-managed solution, um, well, some of our settings didn't come over exactly the way we thought they would. So our VPN wasn't locked down to a set group of users. It was essentially open to the entire university. Now keep in mind, we also don't have MFA on VPN, so any user can now VPN into our environment. Number two, the user account compromised. Um, we saw that service accounts were compromised and we saw um, IT, an IT user account that was compromised. Those were, I don't know exactly how those came in, but we do know that they came in probably through um, maybe a phishing email, somehow, some way, a password was compromised. A user then came in over VPN and laterally moved through our systems until reaching the server environment. Once they got to the servers, they located the hypervisor, they exfiltrated other passwords and data, and they were able to infect the root hypervisor with ransomware. Sometime in that range, they also managed to find our secondary backup location, at which point they wiped out all the backups stored there. They created numerous backdoor accounts to get back into our system in Active Directory. And finally, the EDR doesn't detect things on the hypervisor OS. It's, it's made to run at the OS level. So as things were getting encrypted and changed at the hypervisor level, nothing was there to really scan and watch for any changes there to alert us. Back to our timeline. On April 24th through June 2nd, kind of a, a range there of a, a week and a half, the negotiations with Lockbit continued. They wanted $1.25 million. At that point, we thought 75 gigs. We got a partial list of files from them, and then they started claiming that they actually had more data. They have 175 gigs of data. I have no idea where this could be. We've we've moved a lot of our stuff out to the cloud. We're refreshing equipment. Where Where's this data coming from? We can't quite put it together. So internal recovery continues with its own set of challenges. It's at this point when the database team comes to me and says, hey, boss, listen, we may have been storing some PII on one of those compromised servers. We're, we're not 100% sure. We, we might have been using it to, to move some data around. We might have deleted it. We might not have. We're not sure, but there might be some there. So that's cool. Uh, our local password manager we run um, on a server in our server environment was on one of those servers that was encrypted. So now we can't get into our local password manager to get those you know very long, complex passwords. Not the easy ones like 12345 that was probably used to compromise our environment, but the actual good ones we can't get to. Interestingly, the Department of Education was notified of our cyber incident just a couple of days after it happened. Um, there's only a very small group of people on our campus that knew about this event at the time. So it seems weird that the Department of Education got wind of it. We actually think that maybe the threat actor reached out to them and notified them as we're seeing with some of these new um, SEC rules um, coming out where, where we're seeing threat actors notify them of attacks. Um, and maybe that was a way to get us to pay early and quickly. On June 2nd, we notified campus of the attack. So it's been, you know, uh, about a month since since everything happened. And we're just now finally, it's been about a month and a half, and we're notifying our campus. Recovery is about nearly 100% complete. Um, through there, we did have issues with backup. So I mentioned our secondary backup location was wiped out. Um, we, we noticed that when we went to the primary to restore, that the primary 
login credentials were synced to Active Directory. So AD auth, AD's down because it's a server, it's been encrypted. So AD authentication is not working. So now we're having trouble getting into the, the primary uh, back, backup system. And keep in mind, the local password manager is encrypted. So our local password account to get in there with that long, complicated password also encrypted. Can't get to it. Um, fortunately for us, we did keep some of our um, incident response plans in hard copy with some of our passwords in hard copy that got us into a few systems to start doing recovery. We, uh, we finally managed to get into our tertiary backup system. So it's important to have three layers. And from there, we were able to do an active directory restore um, from that tertiary location. At that point, AD comes back up. We're able to get back into password managers, authenticating the primary um, backup system. And, and that way, we we're supposed to start to break up our systems. Doing that restore point, we actually went back several months to do an AD restore. That way, we could be pretty sure we'd wiped out all the LockBit backdoor accounts that they'd created. June 6th, so we land on LockBit's landing page of victims that day. Um, June 14th is the data drop date when they plan to release all of our data. At this point, that's when our Twitter posts start coming in. Vultures are swooping in, offering us uh, you know, decryption services and, and golden bullets to help fix our problem. Uh, media starts reaching out to us, asking questions about, hey, are we attacked? How much, how much data is lost? Are any users in, in jeopardy? Uh, LockBit. You know, negotiations continue with them. They start negotiating down on their price because they know that we can recover and likely have recovered since we haven't reached out to them. But they're trying to negotiate that, hey, we won't post your data if you pay, you know, $750,000 or something like that. They, uh, LockBit continues to email users are in, in our environment, letting our users know that, hey, your leadership team hasn't paid us. We have your data. We're going to post it to the world. Maybe you should do something about that. This page shows the um, hypervisor, the root, where we have encrypted files. Um, and you can see the encryptions where it's circled in red. And we also see a restore my files file. And that's the ransom note. This was the first email that our users received in the environment that no one reported at the time. Only a handful of users received. Um, you know, again, showing, hey, we attacked your servers and your personal computers. We have more than 75 gigs of your data, et cetera. So this kind of hard to see, but this is actually what the README file says about the you know restore my files. This is the encryption notice um, saying you know don't go to the FBI, don't contact your cyber insurance because they're you know not there to help you. They're just gonna you know negotiate up and get as much money as they can, and and maybe I should reach out to philanthropists that love my company to help pay for this ransom, and we'll keep it under the rug. I should reach out to Elon Musk. It actually says that in the in the README file here saying that, hey, maybe he'll pay for this ransom and help us out. Don't go to the police. You know, we don't want anything like that happening. Here's some of the social media posts that started coming out on Twitter and, and other places. And then on the far right, you can see the um, a, an additional email that LockBit was emailing to users our environment. We kept trying to block those, but they, they have so many different email accounts that they just kept coming in from different places. Um, but just, hey, we'll give you a good discount, you know. You need to pay this. We don't want to have to go to court. We don't have to have to have any reputational damage. Let's keep this on the hush hush. So June 14th comes. That's our data drop date. Finally, the data drops. 2.65 gigs of data is stolen and posted. That's a far cry from the 75 gigs or 175 gigs that they were claiming. Could you imagine paying $1.25 million for two and a half gigs of data? In that data, which we went through the day that it posted, they had four social security numbers and one immunization health record. Again, that data should not have been there. We have systems for those, um, ideally secure systems where things should be actually stored and, and put away. But again, it was not there. It was stored on, on our server in an old file share that it shouldn't have been in. We reached out to those users, offered standard credit monitoring services. None of them were overly concerned, honestly, I think we've gotten to the point where there's been so many breaches and so many social security numbers dropped on, on the black web, uh, dark web, that people just think, oh yeah, it's happened again. All right, no big deal. I'll take my credit monitoring and move on because what else are they supposed to do? I want to also highlight that the ransom was not paid in this instance. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't because again, two and a half gigs of data. 
So what were some of the lessons learned during this time? Well, I think one of the big takeaways for us was that tabletop with leadership to prepare. Um, our leadership team, when we brought them together and told them that there was a ransomware incident, they were kind of like, okay, are we paying? No, we're not. All right, what are we going to do? We know the steps. Is this going to play out? Who's going to contact the media? Who's going to make the post to the the university? Um, how are we bringing in outside counsel? We kind of had worked through these things already during the tabletop, so people knew how to react and what to do, and that was very beneficial. I think for those of you who want to do a tabletop with your leadership, you should do more than one. And and when you're doing those, take a critical person out. You know, maybe you do one one time and the CFO is not available or you say the CIO is not there or, or the president isn't there to make the call. Do you know who is going to then contact the media? Can, can someone purchase Bitcoin if you want to pay a ransom, even though your CFO is not in? You know, the questions like that that you're not you don't think about as a security practitioner the business needs to think about to make business decisions, um, I think is very important. Number two, have an incident response plan. Our plan saved us. I mean, it, it had, you know, some of our key vendors in it. It had phone numbers. It had um, the systems and the criticality of which they needed to be restored and brought back if you have specific orders like a lot of you do. Um, we had a few of our very important passwords in it, and we keep a hard copy of this in a safe. Um, so we're able to pull it out and reference it even if our environment's down. Um, that gave us a step-by-step -step playbook of what we needed to do. And, and when you're in a very high-stress situation like a ransomware attack, having that response plan with everything already down when you've thought about it and mapped it out really helps. The third thing is check configs. You know, if we had checked our configs with the firewall move after move after move and made sure that some of those settings were in place, we likely wouldn't be in this instance which would have been fine, but it was a great learning opportunity. So I know we're all very busy. We have lots of projects going on. It's always one project to the next project, but I think as a whole, we need to get better at, you know, really looking at things when it gets done. Let's document this. Let's check ourselves. Let's double check ourselves. Make sure those configs are right. Password availability. Um, we, we learned on this one ourselves. Not something we thought about, but, you know, always having a, an on-prem password solution um, to access those those sensitive passwords, those complex passwords, it's useful until it's not there. Well, all right, now you have all these mixed random numbers and symbols and of passwords. <laughs> no one knows those. So actually having accessibility to that is important. We've sort of pivoted some to some cloud platforms now. Granted, there's, there's pros and cons with being on-prem or cloud. You can make that business decision for yourselves, but we want to make sure that we can get to our passwords in the future. Um, the fifth thing, and, and obviously one of the biggest things, is backups, 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 say it three times because we needed three tiers, right? Primary we couldn't get into, secondary was gone, that tertiary saved us. If I didn't have a tertiary backup, I likely wouldn't be talking to you right now because I probably would have been fired and wouldn't be a customer of Pantera anymore and likely just <laughs> would, would be in a good spot to give presentation. So um, fortunately, that tertiary was there. You're able to get to it, you know, scatter your backups, some offline, some online, some on-prem, some in the cloud, you know, really mix it up. Don't have them all tied into AD off, have back doors to get into them. Um, super important in, in combating ransomware. Um, kind of a one for us that didn't really come up until we got into the weeds and really started, you know, diving into this was alternate forms of communication. Um, when a threat actor, threat actor has attacked you, they could be in your environment, reading your emails, watching your chats, you know, they, they have compromised accounts. They could be in there checking that stuff. And if you're having conversations about what you're going to do with them, hey, let's check this. Hey, let's restore this. Hey, we're not going to pay them. Hey, we are going to pay them. You don't want them to know what your game plan is. So have those alternate forms of communication, whether that's texting or for us, we set up, you know, alternate Gmail accounts for everyone who needed to be in the know. And we were talking with outside counsel and our cyber insurance providers and, and different people as we worked through that process. Cyber insurance um, was huge, right? They were one of our first calls. So, hey, guys, I, you know, ransomware attack, you know, we need some help. And they immediately spun out an outside counsel for us. They spun out a incident response team. They spun out threat negotiators. Um, and we had all that stuff up and running the very next day. So we, we hit our, you know, deductible that we had to pay, which was a lot, lot less than what paying a ransom was. And then from there, they kind of covered the rest of it. And, and the team came in and, and handled everything really well. It was a very professional team. I couldn't recommend it more. So those are some of the big lessons we took from that event. And finally, to wrap up, I, you know, thank you for your time. Thanks for listening to this story. And 
and share your attack stories, right? Um, like I said at the beginning, we need to be able to share. We need to be able to tell people what happened, what worked for us, what didn't work for us, how people got in. And that way, all of our uh, all of our peers can can learn from that and hopefully secure our environments and make everything a better world. Thank you. Wow. It's not every day you hear a real-life ransomware testimonial. Thank you, Zach, for that compelling session. And a big thank you to everyone who joined us at this year's Exposure Summit. What a day it's been, packed with insights and hopefully actionable takeaways on how to transform your exposure management programs. At the end of the day, the true power of continuous threat exposure management lies in the ability to continuously test, validate, and refine your security process, ensuring that you're always one step ahead of potential threats. As complexity in cyber continues to grow, adopting a CTEM approach will be crucial in safeguarding our organizations. And of course, Pantera is here to support you every step of the way, providing a platform to help make your CTEM strategy a reality. Thank you once again for being a part of Exposure 2024. Together, let's lead the charge towards a safer, more secure digital future. Stay proactive, stay secure, and let's keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible in cybersecurity. We look forward to seeing you next year. Take care and goodbye for now.